Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us for today's Hamlin Leo lecture, The Inclusive Leader with Dr. Artika Tyner. My name is Molly Glevy. I work in the Alumni Relations Office here at Hamlin, and I'm so pleased to have you join us and uh, Dr. Tyner join us today. I'm going to start us off with some housekeeping and introduction, and then we will get going. First, you will be muted and your camera will be off. I know we know how to do these things now, but as a reminder, if you have a question for our speaker, you can put that into the Q&A in your Zoom dashboard. Uh, if you have any questions or need any help with troubleshooting, you can use the chat. Uh, there's a few of us ready to help troubleshoot and field those questions. So, you know, go ahead and drop your information or your questions into either the Q&A or the chat. We will find them. Uh, don't hesitate to ask, ask questions as we go throughout the presentation today. Dr. Tyner will address your questions at the end of her talk, but don't feel like you have to wait till the end to drop those into the Q&A if you like. Um, a few other things, and I'll mention this again at the end. We have another Leo lecture coming up at the end of April with Professor Brian Hoffman. We have a, an alumni trivia, uh, which we've done lots of, and I know people really enjoy coming up on April 1st. Uh, more details about those events can be found on our website. And with that, I am going to go ahead and introduce our speaker. Dr. Artika Tyner is a passionate educator, author, sought after speaker and advocate for justice. At the University of St. Thomas Law School, Dr. Tyner serves as the founding director of the Center on Race, Leadership and Social Justice. Dr. Tyner received her BA from Hamlin University and due to her passion for advocating for social justice and educational policy reform, she decided to pursue graduate studies at the University of St. Thomas, where she earned a Master of Public Policy and Leadership, and later a Doctorate in Leadership. She provides leadership development and career coaching for young professionals, and has developed leadership educational materials for K-12 students, college and graduate students, faith communities, and nonprofits. Additionally, Dr. Tyner teaches leadership coursework on ethics, critical reflection, and organizational development. Her research focuses on diversity and inclusion, community development, and civil rights. She has presented her research and conducted leadership trainings programs, both nationally and internationally. And I am so excited to have Dr. Artika Tyner with us today to talk about the inclusive leader. Thank you. I appreciate that warm introduction. And more importantly, I appreciate the opportunity to be here as a fellow uh, Piper to celebrate this opportunity, uh, my learning journey, that truly um, the learning journey for me is based upon my experience in being a Piper. And being a Piper, one of the things that stood out to me was the ability to work across cultures, to learn, to engage, to play, work together in real time in the sense of community. So our opening exercise will be related to one key thing. I'm going to ask you just to take a couple moments. And actually this exercise is from the Race Card Project that was created by Michelle Norris. It's an invitation for all of us to be grounded in our stories because our stories shape our leadership journey. So I'm gonna give you just two minutes. I want you to think about six words, so six words, uh, that identify your leadership story. So I'll give you my own so you get a sense of who I am. My leadership story is identified by these six words. The first one is faith, of being a woman of faith. Um, also Rondo, that I was born and raised in the Rondo community. And that's really what ignited my passion in becoming a civil rights attorney. Also that I'm an educator, a lifelong educator. I love teaching my students. Um, also that I'm a writer. And then you already heard me talk about this, civil rights being at the heart of not only my vocation, but at the heart of really my passion for social justice. And then last but not least, endeavoring on this pathway each and every day on becoming a better leader. So I just want you to take just two minutes, write down the six words that help to describe your story, your leadership journey, and who you are. So take just those two moments and we'll come right back together because I think it's a good opening exercise to ground us as we prepare for this journey on learning more about inclusive leadership. Thank you. Thank you. And I know some of you asked, please feel free to at least share one word. You can share it in the Q&A feature as well to get a sense of maybe how some of our stories align and what are some of the ways that we can learn and grow together. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. 
let's have that introduction to what does it mean to be an inclusive leader. So when I think about inclusive leadership, I really think about the power of imagination, an invitation to look ahead to the future. Inclusive leadership does have some key components. First of all, what it can do for us in real time is, can you imagine greater profitability, increasing your company's revenue by more than 24%? Can you also imagine greater productivity and improved employee recruitment and retention? So that's being able to, by at least 35%, increasing your likelihood to outperform your peers. And last but not least, this is research from the Greater MSP and ITASCA project that can we imagine a stronger local economy helping to be able to increase both our state and local tax revenue between $300 million to $700 million? What do all three of these components have in common? The profitability, the productivity, and a stronger local economy? Tapping into our human capital. And that's really the proposition as it relates to inclusion in real time. And you may be wondering, Dr. Tyner, why would you start there? I think it's important to ground the conversation. For far too long, we've only talked about diversity, equity, and inclusion in a sense of what does it mean in interpersonal relationships and working in teams together and looking at it potentially even as a moral imperative. How do we create a better sense of community? All those things are important. But I would add, based upon my research, an often forgotten piece of this component is the business imperative of diversity, equity, and inclusion. It is an invitation to think very strategically then for each and every one of us. And I'm grateful for all of you that are here. So we are a large crowd coming together and working together. This is an opportunity for us to truly think about how we can lead change. And my premise that I would give you is that this idea about leading change is about a call to action to leadership. It's really about leadership not just being a destination, but truly a journey on how we can lead change in real time. So thinking about the fact for me, uh, my books have covered both from teaching children the basics of leadership development and inclusion, but also for adults. So writing a book series, which includes the most recent book, The Inclusive Leader, as an invitation for each and every one of us to think about how we can be impactful, how we can lead change in real time. And for me, that is related to the premise of asking one question. And I'll pause just to ask it for everyone now. That question of how can we make a difference? But we have to make it personal. That question is really about what is in our hands to make a difference in the world. So when we look at that, it's an invitation for us, whether we identify as the younger generations. I was at the high school group this week teaching them some of these basic principles about inclusive leadership. So no matter your age, it's really begging the question of how you will make a difference and what's in your hands to make a difference in the world. So an invitation around change in real time. So here it is, just more data on this business case which is critically important. This particular piece is about how can we lead the way? So I'm gonna bring you some data from a group called Great Place to Work. And what they're working on in particular is a type of research to help us understand what are the benefits of an inclusive workplace. And here are a few highlights from their most recent report. A 2016 study found annual revenue gains at 24% higher for the most inclusive workplaces when compared to their peers, which lack a diverse workplace environment. Next, companies with gender diversity, and when, it's 50, when they have gender diversity, they're 15% more likely to outperform their peers with less diversity. Coupled with that, ethnically diverse companies were 35% more likely to outperform less diverse businesses. So when racial gaps at work shrink, notice we're going to go full circle with that. Can you imagine, please? We can imagine a few things now that we know about. We can increase employees' productivity, brand ambassadorship, and retention rates. In addition to that, here's a sense of what I think we all need to know as leaders and those who are trying to create these type of inclusive workplaces, that it's also an invitation around change because employees are watching and employees are experiencing challenges day by day. But what if we change all of those challenges into opportunities for change and creating the type of workplaces where human capital is tapped into in a way that innovation can emerge, participation can be stronger in that workplace productivity and that workplace cohesion in real time. So only 42% of employees believe their workplace prioritizes gender diversity and a mere 22% 
see racial diversity as an important concern for their company. And that's according to a McKinsey report. But here it is, an invitation of what we do need to know. We do need to know that things are changing. I think Bob Dylan said it best, that times are changing. And what we know is changing in real time. And in fact, I just received a report this morning related to the census data. That in fact, the census data from 2020, in many areas, there is a premise, and we're still collecting some of the data from 2020, that potentially that we had gross underreporting in the category of racial and ethnic diversity. And why is that important? Because it means we have an opportunity to really celebrate that America has become more diverse than it has ever been imagined in real time. So in some ways, we can take this opportunity and we can meet it in one or two ways. We can meet it with fear or we can meet it with faith. Now, I chose the latter. And when I'm talking about meeting this changing dynamic um, related to faith in real time, it means then that we have an opportunity uh, to think about how do we tap into human capital? How do we make sure that if we're bringing a team together, and for me, I'm just going to make it personal. I think it's important for the teams to be interdisciplinary. I think it's important for teams to be intergenerational, cross-cultural, in real time. Because I believe, and my mantra, if you've ever been in my classroom, is simple. When we see a problem, we can create a solution. And in order to do that is an invitation around leadership in real time time. So here it is. As we think about that piece, we get the sense of what we can see around change. And that change, if we look at the multicultural tapestry, and this is how Dr. Maya Angelou referred to America as a rich multicultural tapestry, we know one key thing. We know that the United States is both browning and aging. And this is from the data that we have so far from the 2010 U.S. Census. We know then that the Caucasian population grew by only 6%, while also its proportion of the total U.S. population continues to decline. While for the African-American population, it grew by 12%. And the fastest growing population is the Latinx community or is identified by the U.S. Census. The Hispanic population grew by 15.2 million people or 43%. So with current population projections, the U.S. will no longer have an ethnic majority by what year? And when I say ethnic majority, I'm talking about the actual number, 50% or more, related to any particular racial and ethnic group. So please, you can write in the chat. Let me know. What's your guess? What year is it? What's the number that we should know based upon current projections? 2035, 2050. Let's hear a few more. All right, we're getting now 2025. Okay, I'm seeing a lot. Okay, 2025, 2030. Um, okay, all right, sounds good. So we're getting a sense it's within the range. And for those of you who said right now, you're on course. Because the reality of it is, by 2019, based upon the research and data from the Children's Defense Fund, we knew then that the fastest growing rate of new births were related to children of color. So when we think about these numbers specifically, we get an invitation once again to lean into faith of the possibilities of what we can create, what we can build together in real time. I think the other piece of this changing racial and ethnic landscape, and notice, and I'm just going to put a caveat here, you will hear me talk primarily about race and ethnicity today because that is the body of my research. My research focuses primarily on racial disparities related to economics, related to criminal justice, and related to education. But I think the other thing that I'd like to add into this analysis, that the year for that previous slide that you saw, the year that has been specified was initially when I started doing this work nearly two decades ago, I would have said 2060. And then I would have said, okay, we're getting to about 2050. But with current projections, that year is 2043. I think there's something also that you should keep in mind, that it's not just about the diversity here in America, but this is a global opportunity to tap into the innovation, the creativity that's happening in real time. So for instance, and once again, I like for my lectures to be interactive, please place in the chat, which country will outpace America in being the third most populous nation? Which country? And I'll give you a hint. It's in a continent. The continent is Africa. And I'll pinpoint you a little closer as well. It's in West Africa. So which country is outpacing America in population growth? 
Oh, you got it right on first try. I can just end right there with the two Nigeria. And I encourage you to continue to follow this trend to understand what is happening in real time, because we know that the fastest growing rates of not only birth rates, but also the fastest growing rates of entrepreneurship in real time is happening in Mama Africa. So for many of us, I know Judge Lejeune Lang has been one of my mentors for a number of years. And I remember even when I was that young piper, I met Judge Lang, admired her and said, one day I'll be a brilliant attorney just like her. But what stood out to me from Judge Lang beyond saying, hi, how are you? And I know in Minnesota, we say, how are the Vikings? How's the snow? How's the weather? Judge Lang went directly to one point. She asked the question of whether or not I had a passport because she was getting me to have a deep understanding that my work and my ability to engage and be prepared for the future was having an understanding that I was a global citizen in real time. So kudos to Judge Lang for making that early introduction, even when I was a college student. So here it is. In addition to a multicultural changing landscape around race and ethnicity, we also see, and you can see on the slide here, we have dramatic changes related to being intergenerational in the workplace as well. Today, it's a moment in history that's dramatically different, that you have five generations together working in the workplace. Once again, is it a fear or a faith moment? I think faith in the capacity of what we can build together. But unfortunately, when I'm out working with corporations, large, small, nonprofits in between, oftentimes it becomes a, a sticking point, a potential conflict. I think it may be unnecessary because if we can find the ways strategically to work together in real time, to create, to build, and to innovate, imagine what we could do together. So imagine then we have the traditionalists, and then we know the fastest growing population in the sense of who represents the vast majority are the baby boomers in this intergenerational piece in the workplace. But we know we have Gen X, Gen Y, Gen Z all coming together. So it means it's an opportunity for us to think dramatically different. Maybe the work day looks different. Maybe we use different technology depending on which generation we're working with. But either way, do we draw upon the wisdom and knowledge of the traditionalists and then take it with some innovation from Gen Z? What would we do? And these are all invitations based upon the data to think ahead to the future in real time. So as we look at the next slide, we get a sense then that if we're looking at all these pieces coming together, we're getting an invitation to lean into this capacity around leadership. So I developed this leadership framework for action model as an opportunity to give us some critical tools to make inclusive leadership come alive. Typically, you're only focusing on the interpersonal level. You may have a training on unconscious bias, on microaggressions. You might go a step further on the interpersonal level and think about maybe how do stereotypes or prejudice impact the workplace, impact teams. And then occasionally you may get to the organizational level to think about what can an organization do in real time to create and manifest change. And potentially, depending on what your passion is, and if you say, what's in my hands to make a difference in the world, the transformative power to move beyond race, creed, background, to really make justice, equity, and freedom come alive, then you're looking at the societal level. So this is an invitation to bring all of these pieces together simultaneously. So based upon my dissertation research, based upon the research that I do each and every day, when I created this framework, I had in mind, how would I help to take all the information experiences that I had over the years to bring it together in one tangible place and structure to say all of these things must happen simultaneously. So we can't just check the box. I went to the diversity training, my work done for this year. No, 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 no. It might be the requirement for your professional development, but there's so much more. And I hope that you already understand that there's so much more related to the benefits that you can have by tapping into each of these components. Now, I know we only have a short time together, but I have the opportunity now to introduce just a couple strategies that we can take with us today. So I hope you're ready. Next slide, please. The first thing that I want you to think about is how do you define leadership? I want you to just come up with one word, just a popcorn. You throw the word in the chat and we'll take it along with us and we'll, we'll uh, move forward on it. But what's the one word when you think about leadership? And for me, I'll be honest, for me, I was always like, not me, it's someone else. But here it is, it is you, you do have the potential 
and we'll talk about it further. It's not related to your position. It's not related to your title. It's not related to the sense of agency. And I'm almost going to start preaching here like Dr. King. If you haven't listened to his message called a drum major instinct, I have to pause and give you a little bit of homework and I'll be giving homework throughout. The opportunity of listening to the drum major instinct, it was a speech that was given by Dr. King exactly 60 days before he was assassinated. And if you have not listened to it, let me give you a little context. Dr. King basically wrote his own obituary in that speech. He told you not to worry about if he was a Nobel Peace Prize winner. Don't worry about all the accolades that he had. But in fact, make sure that you were worried about that component called servant leadership, that he who was greatest amongst you. And this is going back to Jesus and how Jesus is explaining it to James and John. You don't need to be on my right or left side. What you need to have your focus on is one component. Have you left the world a better place than how you found it? And I'm seeing many of your responses in the chat. You're talking about change, inspiration, opening up the doors for people that are coming after you. Dr. King gave us a sense then in that drum major instinct speech that we all can serve because it's based upon first our heart, having that heart full of compassion and love. That's what he talked about for the beloved community. But also then going from heart, because some of us just stop there. I'm well-meaning, I'm nice, that's enough. No, taking action to tear down barriers, tear down walls and create the opportunity for inclusion to come alive is about access. It's about being able to say, well, if we lack gender diversity, what can we do about it? If we're creating a pipeline into our career, I remember someone passed me a note during a meeting, I was talking about inclusion. And the individual said, well, I've been in my career path. You know, they were already talking about in the meeting for about 40 years. So going to the sunset of this particular individual's career. But yet the note that the individual passed to me said, there has never been a person of color in my whole profession. Um, you know, for me, that's something where you just hand the note back and you ask the question, and what will you do about it? How will you create change? How will you sponsor? How will you coach? How will you create that pipeline? So that's an invitation to leadership. So in the next slide, you will see that I have three words that come to mind for me. It's related to vision, social justice, and service. So let's start with vision. This piece is from Oprah Winfrey. Oprah Winfrey gives us an invitation that if we want to create change, if we want to manifest those tenets of freedom and justice in real time, we have to first take action. That's why planting that seed. And then also, I think that is inherent in this definition around vision, that we then work in collaboration with others to bring forth change, that together, I can't do all the work. I can't plant the seed, water it, prune it, prepare the ground. These are some things that vision, I would give us an adjective to put in front of it, a collective vision. How do we build it in real time? Next, of course, for me, leadership is about social justice. And when I'm thinking about leading something, I'm thinking about the impact in real time. What can I create? What can I impact? So that definition is from Ida B. Wells. And here's a bit of homework. If you're not familiar with Ida B. Wells, there's two things that you should probably know about her. Of course, we know her as a member of the suffragist movement, fighting for equal rights for women related to voting. Now, unfortunately, as we talk about, and this is why it's at the forefront of my mind, of social justice and equity. Yes, equity was around working to get the 19th Amendment ratified. But equity was also around the fact that still yet women of color were not included in the provisions that emerged from the 19th Amendment. In most instances, women of color did not vote until the civil rights movement leading to the Voting Rights Act. This is an invitation around social justice. If we're going to create change, we all need to get involved and be mindful of all stakeholders and what's the impact. So no matter how powerful she was, in many instances, Ida B. Wells was sent to the back of the line in many of the marches during the suffrage movement. Oftentimes she was ignored and not invited to the table to engage around what was quote unquote a women's issue. But then the question would be, was it for all women? And what was the design? And how do you make a social justice movement more inclusive? That's just one dimension of her life, which would be enough, but she was one of those all-stars. The other dimension that I want you to know about is her work as a journalist and as a writer. She wrote a book called The Red Record, which documented the history of racial terrorism and lynching in America. And if you've not read it, please add it to your reading list. 
because it will give you a sense of some of the many issues that she was working on as a journalist in the context around them, because the issue was personal for Ida B. Wells. She had the experience of losing her friends and that her friends were lynched for doing one simple thing, daring to open their own store and daring to help to support the local economics of the black community. So she gives us a challenge. She says the way to right wrongs is to turn the light of truth upon them. And how did she do that? I have the young people do it all the time. She picked up a pen and she said, I will write for justice. Next up, Dr. Maya Angelou gives us a sense of service because oftentimes, once again, you can hear all these things and I've got you motivated. And then you still say, I can't do any of these things. Well, Dr. Maya Angelou makes it simple. She says, if you get, get, if you learn, teach. So she's giving us an invitation that we all can do something in real time. Next slide, please. The question then becomes, all these things sound interesting, Dr. Tyner, but what can I really do? Oh, here's your invitation. How do you develop as an inclusive leader? I'm gonna talk about it in two ways. The next slide will articulate how we ground ourselves in core values. But I think before we can do that and have a core value around inclusion, we have to have some working definitions. So I hope you can take this down. You can take a screenshot, whatever you need. But I think my definitions can help ground us in this conversation to hold us accountable related to change. The first one, inclusion. It's a recognition that all human beings have the right to be valued, respected, and appreciated. This value is manifested by honoring human dignity. Are you doing that? Is it a part of how you show up in a community meeting, how you show up in your faith community, wherever you are? Are you making sure that all human beings are valued, respected, and appreciated? And the other piece is, are you honoring their human dignity? What does that look like in real time? And I think that's something that we could almost write, my bishop used to say, you need a report card. I think you could write a report card on this daily to ask yourself, how do you live up to these premises? Next up, if we define inclusive leadership, this is looking at the fact that leaders who embark on a lifelong journey, this learning journey, to challenge their own biases, stereotypes, and prejudice, they recognize that diversity, equity, and inclusion are the foundation of, and notice I start with business success. Because a part of the challenge that I experience as I do my research on the racial wealth gap based upon our current projections, which of course they worsen with the onset of COVID. But we know pre-COVID, uh, the projections were that it would take nearly blank number of years to bridge the gap, the racial wealth gap, is, that's why it's called that, between African-Americans and Caucasians. If you have not seen the reports, I encourage you to read them. Initially, it was listed at 240 years. And then other reports started to say 228 years. No matter which one it is, my friends, I don't have two centuries to wait. So if we're thinking about, and this will give you a hint on some of the current projects that I'm working on. For instance, I just worked on a book series around STEM leadership for children that specifically looks at diversity and inclusion. I'm also working to build a STEM academy in Ghana for one key reason, data-driven, and directly related to inclusion in real time through professional and vocational journeys. Why STEM? STEM, not just because I was a lab partner since I was 13 years old and love working at the Science Museum and really appreciate the work that the Science Museum is doing today. So a special thank you and shout out must go to Allison Brown, who is tearing down barriers in real time as the president of the Science Museum of Minnesota and making sure inclusion is coming alive. So if you have not heard her speak, if you've not connected with her, I highly encourage it. But when I'm looking at the STEM piece, that was my little infomercial, but let's jump back to the data. Um, STEM careers are growing at a pace faster, two to three times faster than all careers combined. I'll say it again, make sure you heard it all the way in the back. STEM careers are growing at a rate faster than all careers, two to three times combined. That means if we're talking about inclusion and inclusive excellence, are we creating opportunities for all students to be well-equipped to take on those new career pathways, challenges, and opportunities? It's also related to community engagement. I just recently had an opportunity to spend some time in Montgomery, Alabama, and to go to a program honoring uh, Brian Stevenson, 
And one of the things you oftentimes hear him say is community engagement is really about what? Getting proximate to the issues. How can you say you're passionate about social change and making an impact and you're not connected to the issues at hand? How can you say you want to see inclusion come alive and your volunteerism, your philanthropic efforts are not aligning to what you're espousing? So making the connection of community engagement in real time and the last piece is self-explanatory. We have an obligation to whom much is given, much is accounted for, for the betterment of society in real time. How do we create those opportunities? Next slide, please. So we get a sense that it's related to specific skills, some skills that we need. Now, we all may have a combination of skills. I oftentimes tell my students, and if you have not done it, please make sure that you take the now discover your strengths assessment, the strengths finder, to get those top five strengths. By now, you can figure out what mine are. My top three are, one, I'm a learner. So you can see if you need a lifeline or if you're on Jeopardy, call yours truly. I'm ready to go. Facts of history, culture, humanities, all in one. I'm a walking liberal arts education dictionary and encyclopedia. I'm set to go. So learner, which ties directly to my number two, input, meaning I love information. By the time I woke up this morning, I was reading National Geographic. I was reading maps, census reports, Pew Research Report, all in real time over my morning coffee. And last but not least, I'm just giving you my top three. I'm relational. So I love working with people, creating a sense of community. So why are those three things important? Because oftentimes people go, well, she didn't bring any notes. She just showed up. What, how does she know all these things? Because you just learned about my strengths. These things come to me naturally. So the capacity then to think about what are your strengths, your strengths might look dramatically different from mine. You might need to read the full slide, but you put your heart into it, it's equal, we're fine. You might need 20 pages of notes. You might have something that everyone thinks I have, but it's not on my top five. You might be woo. You might have the type of charisma to help move people in real time, whatever it is. If you take your strengths finder assessment, and there's also one free one available called Take Five as well that I assign to my students, you get an opportunity to know exactly who you are. So through the power of coaching, and I'm just going to introduce that for just a brief moment, those of you who have not been coached, I highly recommend that as well. Coaching can give you those tools to help identify some of those strengths if you're struggling with this. And why am I spending so much time here? Because roughly only 20% of people, and this is based upon a Gallup global study, are showing up to work every day using their strengths. What a loss of human capital. What a loss of possibilities. But more importantly, what a delay in making inclusion come alive. So take inventory of what your strengths are and help others as well. Because your leadership DNA is really who you are, that signature leadership style. And I know you see on the graph here, I went through these with the introduction of what is leadership. But it starts with that collective vision, a strategy around it, the critical thinking. And this piece is from Bill George. And if you have not read his book, True North, I highly recommend it. it talks about that authentic leadership on how leadership is no longer a top-down approach. It's really about influence and what we can create together. And last but not least, that influence leads us to modeling the way. So the next slide will give us a sense then of what leadership has been defined as. It's oftentimes like, here I am on top, I'm the champion. It's about a position or a title or a hierarchy of power. But the next slide will give you a sense that it's really about something far deeper. The next slide will show you that the idea of who you are as a leader has to be redefined. And this actually comes from my dissertation. It led me to create a nonprofit organization that focuses on this essence of planting people growing justice. This idea that ordinary people can have an extraordinary impact if they have clarity of vision, clarity of purpose, and are willing to help to plant those seeds of change. Next slide, please. So you get a sense then that a part of this work and knowing our leadership story, knowing who we are, is to do our inner work. And I'm certain that probably the vast majority of you have looked at this. The sense of one piece that I can do for this inner work, this interpersonal piece, is to have a clearer sense of what are the biases and prejudice that may be impacting me in real time. So if you have not, I give you an invitation, free of charge from Harvard, a little more homework. There are the implicit association tests. It can be an invitation for you to learn more about what shaped your leadership story. The implicit bias piece is oftentimes a challenge for me because I remember the first time I went to implicit bias training, I was like, not me. No, no, no. I go to Sunday school. I didn't learn 
I don't see color. I don't see anything but love. So not me. I couldn't have bias. And I also declared, based upon the statement at the bottom, is, well, it doesn't align with my declared beliefs. And then I was like, I have these avowed commitments from this first bullet point. I, there's no way. As a lawyer, I mean, Lady Justice is, has two things going on. She can't see the plaintiffs and the defendants. She also is weighing out the scales of justice. So there is no way I could be impartial or have any type of bias. Impossible. So I was like, okay, just check the box. Keep this train done for my professional development. Keep my attorney license moving on. But as I delve deeper into the research, next slide, please. I realized that implicit bias is almost like the air we breathe. It's something that surrounds us. It's something that oftentimes is ignored, but it is right there. So for instance, race is a social construct. Why did it take me coming all the way to Hamlin as a sophomore in college to understand this fully? It was because a special man came to visit us. He's now a professor emeritus from McAllister College, Dr. Mahmoud El Khani. And he helped us. And if you haven't read his book, here's another piece of homework. Read his book, The Myth of Race. He helped me to understand that race is a social construct. It is a vehicle that has been used politically and socially to create systems of inequities. So you can see his statement related to race. You also can see Toni Morris's statement. But basically what it's giving us is an invitation to think very strategically about how we use the information that's presented to us. If we're thinking about implicit bias and race, do we let implicit bias define someone just based upon when we see them? And if you look at the research from the Harvard Implicit Association test, you can see the resounding answer is yes. We're looking at more than what we see as being the idea of how we identify someone. And let me just give you a little caveat. Oftentimes, and I've just called on this over the past week, someone said, well, tell me then, what is the idea on how minorities would process this particular issue? I said, oh, wonderful, great question. Because first of all, you have to unpack that quite a bit. Who said I was a minority? If I'm a part of the African diaspora, I'm a part of a 1 billion strong and growing, exceeding 1 billion, 1 1.4 is our rough estimate across the world. So it depends on even where I am, where the term minority even could possibly make sense. And even people are riddled up. They think I'm sitting here in my home in St. Paul and they go, well, it's a majority minority city now. What do these words even mean? So we'll need a whole new vocabulary if we're going to think about inclusion in a strategic way. But the reason why I even engage in the question around what is my experience as a minority, because I wanted to make sure it was before a student group that was challenging even the term, does it make sense and beyond a statistical piece of data, but would you call someone a minority? I don't know. These are some things you have to grapple with yourself. Um, but the question of what does it mean to be a minority? When did I become an expert on what it means to be a minority. I can tell you my own personal experience, but to have the obligation to talk about every other racial group or every other group of gender and orientation, I think that's a high mark for one person with one experience. So I think a part of this premise around what is race and race is a social construct is also making sure that we are not engaging in a way that we're saying everyone is every one thing. That any particular racial group is not one monolithic group and that it's not one just simply homogeneous experience. So the next slide, please. It becomes an invitation for all of us to do, I call this my Michael Jackson moment, to take a moment to look at ourselves in the mirror through the power of critical reflection. What has shaped our understanding of race? We'll use that because like I said, that's my body of research. I look at racial justice issues. What has shaped our experience? What are those myths? And what also are those rituals? Because I was surprised. Even as a student, I grew up in the Rondo area. I was shocked at how many people, in or at, even at orientation at Hamlin, said that they would never go to the area surrounding Hamlin because they were fearful or they were afraid. And many of the people had never even been in St. Paul. So all of a sudden, yours truly. Remember I said I was a lifelong educator? Oh, I was doing uh, bus tours out my, my Pontiac. I was taking a few people at a time. Like, let's go to Target. Some of them had never, and I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I love White Castle. They had never been to a White Castle. 
to leave it. So I said, let's go. Because seeing was believing that what you had been taught wasn't necessarily true. So what are those experiences that have shaped your view in real time? And how can you change perspective? Next slide, please. It's an invitation. And this is another one that I want you to think about. I want you to explore your cultural background. How has your leadership story shaped your worldview? So this is just one example. You can Google and find others. I want you as a homework assignment, start working on your diversity wheel. Look at what formulated who you are. What is your background? What's your experience? Because all those components then shape your worldview. And I don't know about you, but I'll tell on myself, there are some ways that my worldview needs to be expanded. And there are some ways that it can grow. And there's some blind spots. And I remember in one particular instance, I was with a colleague at a program and I thought, I haven't spoke to this colleague in a long time and we're gonna be together all day long because they assign groups based upon the diversity wheel. So I thought, oh, we are the only two African-American women here. We will have a whole eight hours together long overdue. I miss my sister girl. I guess you could probably guess which direction the story is going to go. By the time I finished my diversity wheel, we were so far away from each other, there was no chance that we would ever be in the same group throughout that day. Because I jumped right to race, I jumped right to ethnicity, and I jumped to gender. And there were remarkable differences between this individual and myself, which is fine. I think that's the beauty of diversity, that rich tapestry that Dr. Maya Angelou talked about. But it also was eye-opening for me because I didn't realize my own bias was an assumption when I walked in that room that we would spend the next eight hours together because of course we would be in the same group. So those pieces of challenging those biases in real time is an invitation to get grounded in, next slide please, this piece on who you are and understanding your leadership story. So I oftentimes say that a part of learning is reflecting and growing. So here's an invitation to pause, reflect and grow. If you have not taken the Harvard Implicit Association test, IAT, Here's an invitation. Take a few today. They only take a couple minutes and see what you identify as your top areas of growth. And when I do my work around inclusion, I always put myself as a first case study. I thought I love everybody. So I'm going to perfectly find no bias here. Check the box. And by the time I took my IAT, I found a lot of biases that I had never even recognized. And once again, did not align with my spouse values. And that's go through that diversity wheel. Think about what are the things that really shape your experience as well. So in a few moments, we'll have a Q&A. So make sure if you have some questions that you're putting them in the Q&A. There's just a couple more points that I want to go through before we switch to our Q&A. Next slide, please. Next slide, we'll go to organizational piece. And this is where I'll leave off. This component of my research, I think, is critically important. Now, if I'm comparing, contrasting, knowing your leadership story is where you have to start. Because if we're going to create change, this is really going to be related to you and I in real time. But a part of what I also want to see in our lifetime, in our lifetime, not somebody else's lifetime, not a hundred years from now, I want us to be very strategic in the type of organizations that we create. Oftentimes I'm challenged and people say, well, the idea is if all these things are true, then once we all die off, the change will be here and we don't have to worry about all these issues. Nice try. The reality of it is many of these issues are already incorporated into who we are and what we do. I'm a baker. Mother loves to bake bread. I love to bake cakes. So you're not going to tell me that my favorite signature cake is a pumpkin spice cake. And you're not going to tell me that you can pull out the individual component after I mix the cake with the nutmeg. But of course it's there or the pumpkin spice, but it's, it's there. So here it is. All these things are mixed in and baked into the cake. So here's our opportunity though, that we can create a legacy of change. What we did today fits into, of course, the arena of education. We're learning, we got some homework, we have some new ideas to build upon. But I also want us to think very strategically about policy. I want us to think about this still yet today, I'm gonna focus on women's justice issues. And I was appointed by Governor Dayton to the Young Women's Initiative. And one of the things that stood out to me is we knew the challenges. We knew that based upon the data, it would not be until 2059 that women in Minnesota would receive pay parity. We know the data, lean in, reports it annually. 
We know that as an African-American woman in 2022, I'd have to work all the way until summer 2023 for equal pay, for equal work. For a Latina, I have to work all the way into the next fall, until about November. We know the data. We studied it time and time again. But have we created this type of policies and hiring practices? And I'll just make it one thing since we have a short amount of time together, even related to something like pay parity. Why have we not addressed this issue? So oftentimes people say, well, why are you so concerned about it? That's one that we can address in real time. We have the data. Equal pay for equal work. Evaluation. Let's see where we are. If we're going to espouse all these values. So I do case studies of organizations all the time. I look at what they post on their diversity plans and what they're seeking to do. The post goes up, a beautiful picture goes up, and there's nothing to evaluate any progress. I think if you're going to say you're committed, then we should be able to visibly see your progress on that plan to assess where we've gone and where we need to go. And then, of course, related to benchmarking, to have an opportunity to really say, where do we seek to be? Because that will guide us on how we get there. So, for instance, one of the case studies that I've enjoyed exploring over the years is related to Intel. Now, I didn't think anything of, I thought that's a nice plan. It looks beautiful. The brochure is interesting. But Intel was dramatically different than anything that I've seen in developing a strategic action plan. It was clearly data-driven. For instance, when they talked about increasing diversity, they didn't just say increase BIPOC diversity. Why? Because they already would have won. Because they already had diversity primarily in one category for Asian Americans. Instead, they held themselves accountable very publicly and said, no, 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 we have to make sure the Latinx community is included. And if we're at, and just say hypothetically, if they were at 2% Latinx population working for Intel, then how do we get to 10%? What does that look like? How does it reflect the demographic and society in real time? And to have a benchmark, they didn't really have any peers that were doing what they were doing. And you can see it. They have Senate testimonies. They brought themselves even to the nation's capital to advocate for change around inclusion. They had to make themselves their own benchmark to say that they would be reflective of the society that they live in in real time. So here's my invitation for you. What's one strategy that you would recommend for your workplace? Is it more education on some of the issues that I talked about? Do you think there needs to be some policy changes uh, around hiring, around retention, around inclusion in the workplace in real time? Maybe your workplace needs to more publicly evaluate what we're doing. What are they seeking to accomplish? What's the progress? And then last but not least, of course, I think is the most important piece where we need to start benchmarking. Where do we want to be? And how do we set a standard for everyone else that we can all live up to to aspire for our children's children to inherit a world where we still haven't done it? We love to quote Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech where the children are not measured by the color of their skin, but we're looking at the content of their character in real time. So I guess the next question I would ask for you is, how do you support implementing this strategy? And you can't tell me, well, I'm not the vice president. I'm not the president of my organization. Remember, if we're redefining leadership, it doesn't matter where you're situated within the organization. It matters whether you have that heart. As Dr. King talked about the drum major instincts, so we're going full circle, generated by love and a commitment to serve and lead change. So I'll conclude with a quote from Bayard Rustin, because I think this can help ground us in what we can do and how we can get there. Bayard Rustin, and we know is a strong, he was a strong advocate during the civil rights movement. Um, many of us didn't notice, but he was right there on the stage, working very closely with A. Philip Randolph. Why am I spending some time giving you context? Because oftentimes we only care about the person's name that we see on the big screen. Bayard Rustin, most people don't know his name, but in many ways he was the community organizer and really the engine of our modern day civil rights movement. And he gives us a sense of, purpose and action. Because you can listen to and say, oh, she was so eloquent. I, it was interesting. Oh, I took away a lot. But notice what Bayer Rustin said. The proof that one truly believes is in action. The proof that one truly believes is in action. So here's your opportunity to take action. Today, based upon some of the key components that I talked about, about discovering the leader within, having the ability to empower others to lead, building authentic relationships, fostering innovation, establishing those strategic outcomes, being those innovators that build sustainable and durable solutions, those all sound like components of inclusive leadership. And more importantly, it's an opportunity for us to do one of the most important things, bringing everyone together on our shared humanity and common destiny. So here's an invitation for change that starts with you and I. So with that, I will formally end and give that official invitation 
to have an opportunity to engage on some of the questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you for your participation. Thank you so much, Dr. Tyner. Um, and I'd invite, we've got a bit of time. I would invite anyone who has questions to go ahead and drop them in. Um, we might, we won't get to all of them. One other thing I want to mention is some of the references that Dr. Tyner, some of the homework, some of the um, resources, we'll put those together um, and send an email to those who are here today if, if you'd like to look into those. Um, first question, do you have strategies for inclusion in faith communities or would they be similar to the workplace? I think they would be similar to the workplace, but I think one of the things that we have to really engage related to, and I see a lot of folks going in the direction of interfaith coalitions and cross denominations, bringing all these components together. I think you still have to get to the core of what is your collective vision and what do you hope to accomplish together? So I had a unique advantage growing up. I went to, um, I, I had busy weekend then, but I went to Hebrew school on Saturdays. So I learned about the Torah and um, had the opportunity then, of course, on Sunday to have my traditional Sabbath with my faith community. Why am I highlighting that? Because a part of what I think oftentimes we're missing is that we have a lot of commentary, but the preparation and engagement is oftentimes missing. So once again, I'm going to use that piece from Brian Stevenson. In order to have any connections in any type of community, it's about getting and becoming proximate to the issues. So I would encourage you, yes, you'd use the same ideas. You'd use the same philosophy. The same way, for instance, I'll give you one quick tip. The way I had the introduction related to what is leadership, maybe that's an exercise that you use to get everyone to come together and ask them to define it based upon their faith journey. It will give you a lot of insight into what's important to someone related to leadership. Use Michelle Norris's activity. Ask, the, ask folks, what are the six words that will identify you? And I'll tell on myself because I think that's important. I was on this learning journey with one of my students who was Muslim when I was in Aspen Institute, and that's where I met Michelle Norris and participated in this activity. And I didn't even have faith on there as my top six. But I thought it was very interesting because I was like, that's inherent. But he went first. And the first thing that he said is Muslim, faith. And then he talked about everything else after that. And it was an aha moment for me because I was so used to being in more secular settings that I would never mention my faith that I had to think about no matter where I am, my faith is relevant. And that no matter where I am, the decisions that I'm making are grounded in my faith. So why would I not just say it? So I learned that day. Dr. Tyner, you mentioned Intel. Do you have examples or, you know, as much as you'd like, you'd like to share or evaluate, do you have examples of local organizations in any sector in St. Paul and Minneapolis who are, who are doing this work, who are committed to this work, who are doing the benchmarking um, or benchmarking? Do you have examples of those? Yes, but let me just be crystal clear. The examples are just to get you started on your own research journey. Uh, you will have to evaluate them, look at the data yourself to assess if that's the metrics that you're looking at and what you need to consider. One that I highlighted in my book in particular, and the inclusive leader does have case studies. And I'm a hometown player, so I put a hometown team in there. I put a local law firm. So I put um, the work of Stinson, uh, formerly Leonard Street and Diner, in the text because it was a great example of how they were running into one challenge. They were thinking about how to ensure that they have more diversity and partners and having a career, you know, open track record of success. How do you get to the next level? So for that career path to partners, they developed a strategic action plan to help increase diversity by changing some of the metrics. Because if you ever worked in a law firm, which I have, the big buzzword is what? Do you have a book of business? And so if, depending on where you are from, depending on your background, depending on how networked you were, you might not have had the same level of a book of business, but that didn't mean that you couldn't be a key stakeholder in the firm or that you didn't need just a little more support to build that up. So they were changing some of the metrics of even that pathway of becoming a partner. Now, let's be crystal clear because I can hear the naysayers behind me. They would say, oh, did you lower the bar? No, they didn't lower the bar. They made inclusion a reality by creating the types of experiences where you can leverage other talents and strengths in new and unique ways because being a stakeholder or a partner of a law firm is also about leadership. It's also about mentorship and coaching and, sp and sponsoring others in real time. One last question, if you've got the time. Of course, please do. Working with K-12 students, but particularly working with college students. 
Are you optimistic? What are what how how do how does that what is how does that inform your work? How do, how should that where do, where do our traditionally aged college student population where do they fit into this equation and, and what do you draw from that? Oh, I draw from students all the time. That's what made me a lifelong educator. Students are, you know, you get that little energy every day. Every time I'm in the classroom, that's what energizes me and keeps me going. I would say the only thing that I would ask for my college students, for my educators who are working with college and K through 12 students, have these conversations about what inclusion looks like. I just did a lecture this week. And one of the things that I talked about with a particular group, they were asking me all the challenges, like how do you deal with discrimination or this person not feeling welcome because all these things are happening so inclusion can't come alive. I challenged them directly because any change, whether it's a civil rights movement, I talked about the women's suffrage movement, it starts with one person. So I want us to make sure that we're cultivating leadership in our young people. Reminding them that you're never too young to make a difference. Reminding them that their voice matters. Whereas, whether it's our young poet laureate, uh, Amanda Gorman, she took words and made them come alive in real time. Whoever it is that inspires you, I want you to then turn around and be an inspiration to someone else. So I think a part of what we have a challenge to do anytime we're working with young people is to help them discover their gifts and talents. As an educator, I oftentimes call myself a treasure hunter. I'm looking for those treasures in each and every student. And in real time, once we find those treasures, we're looking to cultivate them in real time to be impactful. So the invitation is our young people are the future. We can't say that in cliche or, you know, just sing the Whitney Houston song. We have to then know that it's our opportunity and moment to not only train, but also inspire them. And last but not least, model the way. Use our influence. Most young people follow me because they see something that they're inspired to think about how they can lead change. Like, Dr. Tyner, can I join you? I started our nonprofit. I had no intention of creating another venture doing anything else. But I started our nonprofit because of one Piper, Law Tau. Law Tau was my intern. I got a call from Hamlin. I thought, what did I do now? What is this call all about? And I got this great Piper intern. And he said, oh, there's an organization. I want to join you. I was like, there's no organization. I wrote a dissertation. I did a little research. That's it, my friend. I don't know why they paired us up, but you know, I'm flattered. And by the time I went home, I was like, it only could be a divine appointment that God would send me an intern named Law. And that's a fellow Piper that wants to create an organization that can be impactful. To date, we haven't made it public yet, but we've donated over 10,000 diverse books to children in need visited over no, countless number of schools and visited and reached over 5,000 students in real time. And all that took was two pipers coming together with an idea. So I give this as an invitation to everyone. You see a problem, we create a solution. And that was two pipers sitting over there at Ginkgo Coffee, coming up with an idea on how we can be impactful. So we can do what everybody else can. Thank you. I'm gonna read aloud one comment. Uh, Dr. Tyner, you brought the energy today. Thank you for a great start to the weekend. So much to think about and explore. And then the next comment, we can do it. I love it. Thank you. And yes, we can and we will. Thank you so much, Dr. Tyner. It's been such a pleasure to have you here and learn from, learn from you. I really appreciate it. Thanks to everyone who could join us today. We record these and put them on our YouTube page so you can reference later. Like I mentioned, we'll uh, send some email with some links to the, to the resources Dr. Tyner mentioned. And uh, I hope to have many of you join us again. Thank you.